This is Phil Kopman, and I'll be talking about autonomous vehicles and software safety engineering. As an overview for the talk, I'll start by talking about how autonomous vehicles are almost solved, but the almost part is very misleading. They're actually quite a long way from cars being able to drive city to city with no one paying attention. There's a huge challenge here, and the huge challenge is safety. Autonomous vehicles present additional challenges beyond what we see in conventional vehicle safety. And I think that perception edge cases, the ability to decide what something is and to predict what happens next, is a really limiting factor in the safety of this technology. Beyond that, testing alone is not going to get us to safety. We need more than testing, and I'll talk about why that is and the types of approaches that can be taken. Generally, safety requires a standards plus safety case approach, much more than just laborious brute force road testing. You need a life cycle argument to support deployment safety. And I'll talk briefly about a standard, ANSI UL4600, which is heavily concentrated on, did you think of that? Thinking about all the things that can go wrong to make sure that they've been accounted for in understanding the safety of an autonomous vehicle. The autonomous vehicle problem has been 98% solved for more than 25 years. This may come as something of a surprise, but back in July 1995, a Carnegie Mellon minivan went from Washington, D.C. to San Diego 98.2% hands off the wheel in an exercise called No Hands Across America. It was the CMU NavLab 5 vehicle, and it did that on interstate highways across the country, with 98% driving itself down the highway. Moreover, in 1997, there was the Automated Highway System event where there was a demo on an interstate highway near San Diego where not only did a minivan go down the road, but also a platoon of coordinated vehicles and even a city bus. And again, they weren't perfect, but they were very, very good. So this technology has been around for a long time and almost there, but not quite there. That last 2% is taking a long time. So the issue with that, first of all, to deploy this technology at scale is, what about that 2%? Why is that so hard? At Carnegie Mellon University, there's the National Robotics Engineering Center. And this place has had 35 and more years of cool robots. You can see a timeline in the picture. One misconception about autonomous vehicles is they started with the DARPA Grand Challenge. Well, from this timeline, that's kind of at the midpoint. Uh, these things have been around a long time. From a safety point of view, in the early days, there was the big red button machinery safety approach. If something went wrong, somebody slapped the big red button and the whole thing shut down. Over time, that became less and less viable as the systems became more complex and the operating conditions became more difficult to control with just a stop button. Think about it. If you're at 100 kilometers per hour on a highway and the big red button locks up all the wheels and brings the vehicle to a stop, that's going to be a pretty messy exercise. So you need to be more sophisticated when things look less like a piece of machinery in a factory and more like a vehicle going at high speeds down roads. Well, how do you do that? Well, you need to transition from machinery safety to software safety. I was fortunate enough to be at the center of a lot of this as the principal investigator for 10 years worth of research on this topic at NREC. There was an excellent team at NREC who did all the work. I was the principal investigator. But this talk builds on the insights from that team and a number of other experiences I've had. Let's start with some basics. What's software safety engineering? Well, safety is a system property. It's beyond just correct code. Yes, it's really nice to have correct code. If you have bugs in your code, it's going to be difficult to get safety, for sure. But just having perfectly written code that exactly meets the requirements does not necessarily get you to safety. That means, of necessity, safety engineering is more than just looking at requirements and implementing code. Part of it is writing the requirements, but even more is understanding that safety affects the requirements. The heart and soul of most safety engineering has to do with hazard mitigation. The idea is you identify the hazards, things that can go wrong. If X goes wrong, that could result in a loss event, and we need to understand how that could go wrong and what the loss event is and things like this. Those things that can go wrong include hardware failures, tool defects, environmental surprises, 
These are systems that are operating in the real world. And so assumptions that, for example, you will never have a computational defect due to a radiation-induced upset, that's not the real world. Those things happen in the real world. So you have to account for those, especially if you're deploying at large scale where lives are on the line. Once you have a list of hazards, for each hazard, you predict the risk. And typically the risk is probability times consequence. The idea is that if you have something that can be really bad and it happens all the time, you need to do something about that. If you have something that has a very, very low consequence and it almost never happens, maybe you can just live with the risk. The things in between are more typical and that's where you see the hazards being converted over to risks and then you do risk mitigation. The tricky part for all of safety engineering is probably never times near infinite consequence. What's zero times infinity? Well, there's a lot of economic pressure to say, well, we're not going to worry about it because it'll never happen. But usually when people estimate the probability, they're a little bit optimistic and things tend to happen that people thought wouldn't happen. So what you really need to do in safety is weight it a little bit more towards the outcome that even if you think it'll probably never happen, if it's a really, really bad outcome, you still have to find a way to mitigate the risk. If you think about nuclear power plant safety and aircraft safety, you'll find that they spend a lot of effort on things with very low probability, but catastrophic outcomes, and even then, sometimes they get surprised. Once you've figured out all the risks, then you have to mitigate them. For each hazard, you say, here's the risk, and the higher the risk, the more work I put in to make sure it's mitigated down to a place where the entire system has a reasonable remaining acceptable risk. The mitigation typically involves engineering rigor, such as process quality, doing some analysis on the system, some testing, some redundancy patterns, and so on. It also involves the use of functional safety. Functional safety is there may be an internal defect for your system, so you take approaches to mitigate those defects that are eventually going to happen. For example, if you have a malfunctioning component, you detect that it's malfunctioning and you shut it down to get yourself to a safe state, potentially with some sort of backup system taking over if it seems necessary. There's also safety of the intended function, SIDIF. The idea there is that your requirements in the real world will never be complete. There'll always be things that you missed if you're operating in the real world. That means you need resilience to requirements gaps. You have to deal with inconsistent sensor data you have to be able to at least remain safe even if you can't operate in unexpected environments. The big idea here is safety engineering is not simply going from requirements to perfect code. Safety engineering explicitly deals with understanding the hazards in your system and mitigating risks because no system is ever perfect, but a safe system still has to deal with the fact that that's the case. Autonomous vehicle safety is even more complicated than conventional system safety. All the things on the previous slide should be done for any conventional computer-based system when safety matters. But for autonomous vehicles, we need to do more. There are public expectations. People expect superhuman machine performance, including safety, even if it's a difficult, ill-structured task. People are allowed to make mistakes, but computers aren't supposed to. Now, anyone who's worked with computers know that computers aren't perfect. But the default expectation is if something goes wrong with the computer, we need someone to blame because computers aren't supposed to have problems. The other issue is that people are too easy to give trust. They may sit in a robo-taxi and everything looks fine and safe and boring for 5 or 10 miles and they decide it's safe. And then you get a big backlash if something happens on mile 11. Well, those numbers are far too low to establish trust in a system, but this is how people behave. So there's always the risk that if a system is generally well behaved for a short period of time, people overtrust it and feel like the trust has been breached when something bad happens later. Beyond that, there are substantial technical challenges. Machine learning safety is still a work in progress. All the hype you hear and all the autonomous vehicle companies pushing to put things on the road might make you think that it's just around the corner, maybe this year, maybe next. But in fact, understanding safety for machine learning is very much a work in progress. And no matter what you hear, it will probably take longer than what people said for this to be an at-scale safe technology. There's another technical challenge, which is that you're trying to use an inherently statistical approach to deal with high severity rare events. The issue is statistical approaches struggle to make claims of things involving 99.8 more nines after the decimal type of events, which is what you end up with with life-critical safety. 
Possibly the biggest issue is the historical industry culture class operating across multiple different types of stakeholders who have to work together to get autonomous vehicles on the road. One is the autonomy researchers. They've spent decades doing amazing, cool, small-scale demos. I showed a picture from just one research group showing all the cool things they did. And for them, historically, it's been about the cool, small-scale demo. Now, all of a sudden, they're betting huge sums of money on making something real and deploying it at scale, which is a different challenge than they've traditionally faced. Then you have Silicon Valley, the people putting all the money in. They're used to moving fast and breaking things. Well, moving fast... Okay, that sounds nice, but breaking things is not so good when there's people in vehicles involved. So that's an issue. That approach will have to be moderated because of safety. Then there's the automotive culture. The automotive culture understands safety, but is still very aggressive on cost cutting. And one of the strategies they've hit upon over the years is putting the driver in charge of cleaning up any small safety messes and saying the driver is supposed to mitigate anything that bad that happens, if it's at all possible, and so they've taken to blaming the driver for mitigating things that are otherwise equipment failures. Finally, you have the regulators. The regulations today are very test-centric. Take a car out on the road. If it seems to behave okay, then it must be safe. And that no longer works in the era of software, but the regulators haven't changed. They generally have weak digital safety expertise that is changing slowly, but the regulatory world still behaves as if cars were mostly mechanical and electrical components and has comparatively little experience at dealing with computer-based system safety issues and in particular with software. The core issue here is should you trust an autonomous vehicle? Now, to its credit, the industry has figured out that this is actually what matters. Uh, one of the companies put out a voluntary safety self-assessment report and their headline figure is, it's a matter of trust. They're absolutely right. The question is, should we trust autonomous vehicles to be safe? There are a number of issues here. In particular, regulatory issues are very difficult. Stakeholder expectations are difficult and so on. But the one I'll be talking about here is the heaviest technical lift being perception and prediction safety. That's the hard thing, and we're still working on it. Let's dive in a little bit to what I mean by perception, and prediction ends up being part of this. Perception builds the world model. You have a vehicle operating out in the real world. Things happen in the real world. There's a kid kicking a ball, maybe chasing a ball. And there are sensors on these vehicles. There's video, there's LIDAR, there's radar. And all those sensors get combined by a perception system to build a model of the external world. Hey, I think there's a child chasing a ball into the street 10 meters ahead. So that's the perception system. Note that it's both perception in terms of what objects there are, but also implicitly prediction what will be happening next. The child is chasing the ball, so we expect the child will keep going after the ball. Wherever the ball is, the kid will end up. Once there's a world model, you can do path planning, you can do motion control. And to be sure, those are complicated, difficult challenges. But they pale in comparison with the challenge of assuring that the perception is done in a way that is suitable for life critical systems. The perception typically relies very heavily on machine learning. And the question is, how do we actually assure the safety of these systems? How do we make sure that the vehicle is going to know that this child is about to run into the road and avoid hitting the child, which involves not only detecting the child, but also realizing the child is likely to move in a certain direction and then commanding the vehicle to make sure its path does not intersect with the child. If we can do that with extremely high confidence, we might have a basis for trust in the vehicle. But how do we get there with machine learning? It turns out that for perception, the edge cases are likely to be the limiting factor. Sure, it's easy enough to detect a child with relatively high confidence, 90% plus. But for life-critical systems, you need much, much, much higher confidence than that. You basically need to always see the kid in the road. Machine learning is amazing at what it does. In general, it works by being shown a bunch of examples, learning statistical patterns in the examples, and being able to recognize when it sees things that are similar in the future. So if it's seen a bunch of kids with a certain type of clothing in a certain background running into the road, it'll probably be able to recognize that, as long as it looks like things it's already seen. But the world is full of novelty. 
And so one of the issues with these systems is something can be different, perhaps subtly different, perhaps, and we've seen this in the real world, it can be as subtle as changing color of clothing changes the perception performance. So you have this world full of novelty and the machine learning hasn't been trained on every possible thing and may have big gaps in the training that turn out to matter in the real world. Along with this risk of missing pieces of relevant training data is the issue that perception and prediction based on machine learning tends to be poor at get recognizing when it's just guessing. We've seen failure modes in which it will have extremely high confidence and it's completely wrong, typically because it's seen it's something it hasn't trained on. Now I'm aware that there's lots of research in this area and that will eventually make progress. But I'm pointing out that the problem is inherently very difficult and therefore a challenge to apply it to real world systems. Just to bring home the type of problem we're talking about, let me run a little exercise here. I'm going to ask everyone who's watching this to look at a picture and decide if it's a person or a chicken. I'm making the problem pretty easy. You're becoming a human binary classifier. I'm telling you the correct answer is either person or chicken, so you don't have to worry about anything else. I'm going to show you a picture at the count of three, and when you see the picture, I want you, preferably out loud if you can, to say the first word that comes into your mind. Do you think this is a person or a chicken? Get ready. One, two, three. When people see this picture for the first time, they often have an experienced chicken, no weight person, because there's a lot of chickenness in this picture. It's mostly chicken. But once you look a little bit closer, you'll see a woman's face peeking out. And then you realize, oh no, it's not a chicken after all. It's a person who happens to be wearing a chicken suit. The difference between chicken and person has large implications, both in terms of predictive behavior and the importance of not hitting a person if there's any possible way to avoid it. I ran this picture through a classifier online, and it was supremely confident there was no person, 99%. It thought it was a chicken. It didn't really see the face. There are two issues here. The first is, if you haven't been trained on people in chicken suits, you're likely to get this wrong. But the second, more disturbing thing is, the system was incredibly confident that it was not a person, even though it was completely wrong in a way that any human could tell. That's the issue here, that if you see a rare event that looks like something the machine learning has learned, but is completely different in terms of what matters in driving, you might have a system that does completely the wrong thing while not even realizing it's making a mistake. I'm going to call these edge cases. The definition I'll use for edge case is things you didn't train on, you didn't think of, things you didn't see in testing. In other words, things that come as a surprise to your system. It's the stuff you didn't think of. And the limiting factor for a lot of autonomous vehicle safety is simply what do you do about the edge cases? What do you do about things you haven't seen before and how do you make sure, well, maybe you can't work 100%, but how do you make sure you at least know that you're in a situation you weren't designed for so you can do something reasonably safe? The challenge for perception and prediction is covering everything. And there's a lot of everything in the real world. That's the issue. How do you cover all the possible unknowns? Well, here's someone who decided it'd be fun to make a retired jet fighter into a car. Um, I guess it, apparently it's a car. Uh, may not look like one, but anyone driving down the road, a human driver, I think would eventually figure out, okay, well, I'm going to treat that thing like a car. Now you may say, well, I've never seen an airplane on a road. It's like, well, I have, because at some military bases, you go down a road and there's a stop sign and you're not stopping for the cars. You're stopping for the fighter jets going from the hangars onto the main runway. And I can assure you that your car insurance does not cover the collision damage to a modern jet fighter. So this actually happens in the real world, but it may not be something that the system has been trained on. Then there's issues such as puddle of water. How deep's the puddle? Well, this one turned out to be pretty deep. Uh, and so you have to decide, well, yeah, it looks like a flat road, but that looks like puddle, and, and I have to be a little bit careful. Now to be sure, this is a human driver who made a mistake and went into the puddle. The machine learning based systems aren't gonna be perfect. I get that. But these are the kind of things you have to think about look at the risks and decide how much of these things you can cover and decide which things you're willing to take the chance on. There are unusual road configurations. There's the roundabout of roundabout. There's only the one from my understanding, but if that's the town you're driving in, you have to be able to deal with it. So if you train a system that's never seen this before, expect to have a lot of surprises when you start operating in this one town. 
And yes, in fact, on real words, there are people running around in chicken suits. Usually they have a fried chicken advertising sign in their hand, but that's a thing and you may not see it. But when it happens, you have to do the right thing. Finally, there are also things that are quite subtle. For example, here's a person and a bicycle. Now, is the person pushing the bicycle? I'm going to say yes because their hand's intersecting the handlebar. Is the person riding the bicycle? I'm going to say no because both legs are straight and feet are flat on the ground and there's no separation. So probably this is a person walking next to a bicycle. Why is that relevant? Well, the expected speed of a person walking next to a bicycle is different than a person riding a bicycle. Uh, and this is not a hypothetical difference. This confusion between person and bicycle was one of the contributing causes to a fatal crash involving an autonomous vehicle test platform. So these kind of things matter in the real world. Well, how are we going to figure out what all the edge cases are? When the industry started, they said they were going to public road test, and if they did enough testing, they would see all the problems, and they would fix them, and they'd be good to deploy. We're years and years and years later, and eventually the companies figured out that that wasn't enough. It's good for identifying the easy cases. Getting that first 90%, yeah, it's pretty straightforward, because stuff you see every day, well, you're going to see it every day, you can train on it, you can fix it. But the rare cases, the events, are an issue. And more importantly, it's both expensive and potentially dangerous. Uber ATG found this out the hard way in Tampa, Arizona. There's a photo from the crash investigation in which they struck and killed a pedestrian. Even though there were technical issues that contributed to the crash, in the final analysis, the problem was not technical. The problem was an inadequate safety culture. And that's when safety really became on the minds of a lot of the big players in the industry. To this day, there's still a wide variation across the different companies and how much they've learned from that crash. The road testing continues, and we're seeing an increasing number of mishaps out on the roads. There was the Uber fatality that I mentioned in March 2018. And also worth mentioning is that for that and other reasons, the facility closed down in January 2021. Local Motors had a crash in Canada in December 2021, and the company closed shortly thereafter. Pony AI had a crash in California in October 2021. Fortunately, there was no one in the vehicle and no other road users were hurt, but they had their uncrewed test permit revoked, and I have to imagine that set them back. We Ride was filmed having a sleeping test driver also in California roads in October 2021, but the company just deflected the issue as no big deal, and there was no apparent regulatory action. Easy Mile has had phantom braking injuries to passengers who get thrown around in the interior, both in 2019 and 2020. Now, the thing is, there's a standard for doing crude road testing, SAE J3018, that's been around since 2015 and was updated as recently as 2020 in light of the Uber fatalities. But there's only one company using this standard. So we have a Society of Automotive Engineers standard for how to do safe road testing in terms of making sure the safety driver is alert and qualified. And there's only one company who says they follow the standard. This doesn't seem right, but that's the world we live in right now. Despite the dangers, we see the autonomous vehicle companies, for the most part, spending huge amounts of resources on road testing. Now let's ask, how much road testing do you really need to prove safety? Well, if there's 100 million miles between fatal crash, which is the case in the U.S., including all the drunk drivers, by the way, you need to test between 3 and 10 times longer to get statistical significance. That's a billion miles of testing. Well, how far is a billion miles? That's 25 round trips on every paved road in the world, and you're only allowed to have fewer than 10 fatal crashes in that billion miles. And by the way, if you make a change to the system, in principle, any change, but in practice, any big change, whatever big means, that's another problem, you get to start over. So there's no way that brute force testing is ever going to show that this technology is safe. It's too expensive. It takes too long. It's just not feasible. To be sure, you want to do some road testing, but you have to do something else on top of it. Well, people said we can do closed course testing. It has two advantages. One is it's safer because you can control access to the road. You're not sharing the road with other public road users. And also, you can set up whichever scenario you want. If it's unlikely in the real world, you can do it on purpose on a closed course. But it's expensive to run out these test courses. There aren't many of them. And it's hard to get a lot of miles, so it's not scalable. But another more subtle problem is you only test things you think of. 
Volvo famously does a moose test to try and avoid hitting moose and making sure that if you hit a moose, the vehicle's still going to be safe anyway. But they very famously failed when they went to Australia and they hadn't programmed in kangaroos and their distance estimation software had an issue when the kangaroo's feet left the ground. So they'd assumed that there would always be at least a foot on the ground. So if you haven't thought of it, you're going to miss it in closed course testing, no matter how hard you try. Because of the expense of closed course testing and public road testing, people turn to simulation. Simulation is highly scalable. It's certainly less expensive than road testing, but it has two problems. The first one is you have to validate the simulation. You have to do two qualification. How do you know there's no defect in the simulator that's giving you the wrong answer that will cause your real vehicle to have a problem out of the real world? And the other one, it still only tests things you have thought of. So the issues here are, even if you go heavy in simulation, you have to make sure your simulations are suitable for life-critical application, and you have to make sure that you've modeled all the real-world events in the simulation, and we're back to all the infinite number of weird things that can happen in the real world. That's still a challenge. To put this into perspective, let's say you're going to make an argument, oh, my autonomous vehicle is safe because I use some simulation and some other things. How does that shake out? Well, to trust the system, you would have to put your own child, notionally, in front of this self-driving car. It has 10 billion simulation miles, but what if there's a simulation error? It has 100 million miles of data collected to try and sweep up all the edge cases, but what if it's still missing some of the edge cases that happen less frequently than that, but when they happen, they happen? Maybe there's 10 million miles of road testing. Now, 10 million miles is not a billion miles by any stretch, but it might be okay if it's there to make sure that the data you've collected matches the real world and to validate the simulation. But what if there are high-risk simulations that you didn't try in road testing, and that's where the simulation differs from the real world? So you have to take care of that issue. And what if the entire thing was designed with research quality tooling that didn't have any safety qualification for the tools, for the compilers, for the simulators, for the machine learning training and management software, and so on? And what if there's a 5% error rate in the labels for your training data? That's not an unusual kind of number. Are you going to trust that system? Well, the issue is you can't just say the car needs to be safe. Not only the software stack, but the entire tool chain and data quality needs to be validated to be suitable for life-critical systems. This is a heavy lift, but it's the kind of thing you need to do if you're going to build a life-critical system. The way industry handles safety issues is they rely on standards. In every industry except cars, there are a set of safety standards that have been published and the industry follows. Either the regulators make them follow it or the customers make them follow it. So if you get on an airplane or you get on a train or you rely on a power infrastructure, or you have a petrochemical plant somewhere nearby. In all those cases, the reason you generally trust them and believe that they'll be safe is because there are industry safety standards they follow. The car industry is dramatically different. The car industry is not required to follow their own safety standards, and in many cases, they do not. Nonetheless, the standards are there. So let's go down the automotive standards. There's ISO 26262 functional safety. That covers runtime faults and design defects. This standard has been around for more than a decade, and it covers software and computer-based system safety for conventional vehicles, but is still applicable to autonomous vehicles. It assumes, however, that you know all the requirements. You have to have a complete set of requirements for the standard to really do its job. That works for things like brakes and electronic throttle control, but it's not as much as you need for something based on machine learning. For that, there's another standard, ISO 21448, SOTIF, Safety of the Intended Function. And the idea here is it helps you identify and mitigate unknowns. The standard explains how you search for unknown unknowns, and when you find them, you pull them into the requirements, and you mitigate the risk, and you continue until you run out of unknowns. That standard is great as far as it goes. It gives you methodology but it still helps to prime the pump with a list of unknowns so that you don't have to discover every single one for yourself the hard way by driving hundreds of millions of miles. You need, did you think of that lists? Here's an example in downtown Pittsburgh. A bus was driving along and all of a sudden the ground opened up and swallowed up the back end of the bus. Fortunately, there was a human driver who had the presence of mind to say, gee, this isn't right. I think I should let my passengers out before something worse happens. Uh, and eventually a giant crane came and pulled it out of the hole. But 
these types of things happen. There's an essentially infinite list of things that can happen. You will not have seen all of them during your testing and training. On the other hand, if you had a list that said, think about sinkholes, you don't need to wait for the sinkhole to happen to think about it. So to get safety, you need more than just applying these two standards. You need a technically substantive safety argument. I'll get to what that means in a moment. You need evidence of coverage initially at the time you deploy and feedback from surprises. You want to have thought of most of the surprises you can, even if they haven't happened to you yet, and make sure you have them covered. You need to then realize and have the humility to know that you will never think of all the surprises. So you need a very strong continuous improvement process to notice when things go wrong in the real world, even if it does not involve a crash, and learn from them so you can prevent bad things based on initial symptoms instead of waiting for the bad outcome to fix a problem. And you need a way to organize everything so that all these pieces come together to ensure safety. The way to organize them is called a safety case. A safety case helps you organize the argument that you think your system is safe. Generically, a safety case starts with a claim, which is a property of the system, such as the system avoids pedestrians. Then there's an argument as to why this might be true. For example, our autonomous vehicle detects and maneuvers to avoid pedestrians. Then there's some evidence to support the argument. There might be tests, analysis, simulations, and so on. Generally, a safety case will be pretty complex, so there'll be a number of arguments and sub-arguments. For example, there might be an argument that we detect and maneuver to avoid pedestrians. Well, the sub-arguments are we detect pedestrians, and here's some evidence to show you why that's true. And we maneuver around detected pedestrians. Here's some evidence to show you that why that is true. And we stop if we can't maneuver. Here's some evidence to show you why that's true. To be sure, these can be somewhat complex. But the nice thing about having this kind of structure is you can organize all the material, you can look at small pieces, and you can build up arguments on top of other arguments to try and support your claim. Beyond just saying that the vehicle will be safe when it drives down the road, there's more to the safety argument. There has to be maintenance-related safety. What maintenance is required? Has the maintenance been done? How do you know the maintenance was done effectively? There are safety-related aspects of the life cycle. For example, have you managed your requirements properly? Have you done the design properly? Is your machine learning training system effective? What about the handoff to manufacturing? What about putting cars into deployment? What about the supply chain? What about field modifications and updates? Operation retirement disposal. The idea is that a lot of things happen during the life of a safety critical system, and all of them have to be done properly to maintain safety. In line with this, the safety case is not just something you do at design time, but rather each vehicle has associated with it a specific version of a safety case that is kept updated during its entire life cycle. Creating a safety case of this complexity and scope sounds like a complicated undertaking, and it is. To help support the industry with that, there's the ANSI UL4600 standard for autonomous vehicles. The standard tells you how to evaluate a safety case, which means that it doesn't tell you how to build the safety case. It doesn't tell you how to build the vehicle. What it does is provide almost 300 pages of criteria that can be used to assess whether the safety case for an autonomous vehicle has everything it needs to to ensure safety. It provides for independently assessing the safety case, allows mix and match supporting standards, so the ISO 26262 and the ISO 21448 safety standards I mentioned previously, in fact, are quite compatible with this and would provide substantive parts of the arguments for the ultimate claim that your system is acceptably safe. It discourages questionable practices. Safety engineering has learned a lot of bad things that you should avoid doing in the past decades, and a large number of them are included in the standard as cautions or pitfalls to embody lessons learned. It has extensive did-you-think-of-that lists, things that you should remember to think about, such as, for example, sinkholes, but a lot of other things, to make sure your safety case is not missing things that are fairly well-known, but you just didn't happen to see in testing or just didn't happen to occur to you during the system design. Importantly, it treats unknowns as first-class citizens. These systems will deploy with incomplete requirements, with gaps in the training data, there's just no way around that. Even if you got it perfect on the first day, the world would change the next day, and now you'd have a gap in your capability. 
So unknowns are treated as first-class citizens with a balance between analysis and field experience. In particular, there is a requirement to use field monitoring to feed back safety case improvement so that you report data from the field so that you can notice its weaknesses and you can fix the problems by updating the safety case and mitigating emergent hazards with a high probability of having the fix out before you actually have a loss event. The findings from assessments and field data are not only used to improve the system, but also to update the practices incorporated into the standard. The second edition of ANSI UL 4600 was issued in March 2022. The third edition is already underway and will address the special needs of heavy commercial trucks in addition to light vehicles, which are already covered. Wrapping up, we're still on the path to achieving autonomous vehicle safety. There are a number of challenges still remaining. The first is that there needs to be a cultural reconciliation within the industry. We need to get safety for on-road testing right. The driver and the vehicle need to work together to make sure that there are no more crashes that make the news and degrade trust in the industry even further. The good news is SAE standard J3018 exists and would help. The bad news is that most of the companies in the industry not only aren't pledging to follow it, but are actually fighting against regulations that would require that they follow it. The industry in general needs to mature beyond a rushed demo mentality. I understand the pressing need to raise the next round of funding, but if getting the next funding demo to work involves cutting corners on safety, eventually that's going to come back to bite not only that company, but the entire industry with a loss of trust. We need to have stakeholder trust for acceptable safety. The technical problems need to be resolved. There needs to be system-level safety for machine learning, and that's still a work in progress. But we also need to normalize the practice of independent safety assessments. What we found in every other safety-critical industry is that if there is no independent assessment of safety, you don't get safety. And right now, the industry is fighting very hard against independent assessments, especially from external agencies, and that's going to need to change for us to really get safety. The industry needs to embrace safety standards. Right now, they're the only safety critical industry that doesn't really want to follow their own standards, and that's going to have to change. We need to reform the standards optional regulatory approach taken now. Now, the industry can do that on its own, or they can have the regulators come in later after big crash. It's up to them, but that change is going to have to happen to actually get safety at scale. We need to do traditional software safety plus Critically, we need to be able to account for unknown unknowns at deployment, which is a new thing for any safety-critical industry. The good news is that the ANSI UL4600 standard specifically addresses the unknown problem by using field feedback to help improve both the system and the process. I was asked to briefly introduce some discussion starters for the Birds of a Feather session associated with this topic. The Birds of a Feather session will be called Autonomous Vehicles and Software Safety Engineering. And here are some starter questions and topics and thoughts to think about so you can come prepared to contribute. One is, should software developers share blame for fatalities? Right now, the autonomous vehicle industry is going state to state campaigning for regulations that make the operator responsible for anything bad that happens on the roads. It's unclear who the operator might be for an uncrewed vehicle but it's probably not the manufacturers in most cases. Is that the right thing? Should the software developers actually have some blame if there's a fatality or their mishap? Interesting question. Associated with that are the ethics of who gets to decide when it's okay to deploy beta software on public roads, and should that even be a thing? Now, I said the word ethics, so I want to set a ground rule for the discussion. We're not going to be talking about the trolley problem because it's irrelevant for practical autonomous vehicles. There's a YouTube video here. If you really want to understand why I said that, watch the YouTube video. But the word trolley associated with the word problem is strictly off limits for the birds of feather discussion. For machine learning, how do we ensure training data coverage of the operational domain? How do we make sure the training data covers everything you're going to see, keeping in mind that rare events are going to be a challenge? How do we account for high risk of heavy tail events? I'm doing a keynote at the SEAMS conference, which is affiliated with ICSI, and you can see my SEAMS keynote talk for a lot more detail what I mean about that, but this is a major challenge. What about using commercial or research quality software for life critical systems? Is it okay for software that was part of a PhD thesis or was downloaded from GitHub 
to be used in a life critical system? How much more review do you need to do? How do you assure that that software is suitable for life critical use? Don't forget that includes simulator software, simulation object models, machine learning development tool chains, pre-trained models, DevOps, cloud infrastructure, SaaS tool chains. Think about it. If there's any piece of software that could cause the autonomous vehicle to not behave in a safe way, whether directly or indirectly, at some point that becomes life critical software. So what's the plan for dealing with all that stuff? And more generally, what are the gaps between ICSI research results and AV system level safety? There are surely some gaps, but it will be interesting to hear people's perspective on what those might be and how we might address them. Thanks for attending my talk, and I look forward to seeing you at the Birds of a Feather discussion.